Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by one of our security researchers, Craig Young, who we've actually had on the podcast before, uh, but we're here to, to talk about a different topic. So welcome, Craig. Hey, Tim. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So today, Craig, uh, we're here to talk a little bit about vulnerability discovery or vulnerability research. And I wanted to get that conversation started um, by just setting a little bit of context for the audience, maybe. Most of us who are not vulnerability researchers, including me, uh, see the output of that process. So we see vulnerabilities that get published, they get CVEs, they show up in vulnerability assessment products. But behind that output, there is, of course, a lot of work that goes into discovering new vulnerabilities. Can you start by just talking a little bit about what that process looks like? Sure. Yeah. So in general, when we're talking about a vulnerability, we're talking about a situation in which a user input is not going to be handled in the way that it, it should have safely been handled. So when we're looking for vulnerabilities, it's all about thinking about the different places where users, less trustworthy users, can provide input to a system or a program, and then trying to identify what types of inputs um, might go into this process that are going to corrupt it, cause it to give some results that were not the original intention of the developer, and more specifically, things that will undermine the security of the application. So when you when you say user input in that context, um, you know, I obviously think of a of someone sitting behind a keyboard and typing maybe into a form or into a you know a, a website, but there are obviously other types of input that matter. Is it strictly input coming from a user, or is that a, a sort of a broad catch all term for? any types of input that would, would impact or, uh, you know, uh, that a program could accept? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of definitely a catch-all term. Um, sometimes there's not necessarily going to be a human user, but it will be some kind of consumer of a process or a system that's involved with supplying some inputs. So um, a common example of this would be like a network server, that it's going to sit on the network listening for requests from user that might want to log in, um, if we look back to the early days of computers on the internet, something that was common to do would be to just um, connect to a remote service and send a long list of A characters and see if it would crash. And that would be kind of telling you that you've supplied it some input that it's not handling properly. It's doing something um, that was not desirable as a result and that there might be a vulnerability here. Well, and that brings up an interesting point because I, I think we've all... Uh, at some point experienced a, you know, a, a, a crash in an application we're using. Uh, maybe it was because we put in some input or that application received some input it wasn't expecting. But that, that distinction going from, uh, you know, a service or an application crashing to an exploit that allows remote code execution. How are those two things related? Are they related? Yeah, they are related. And this is where the reverse engineering process comes into play. So, in that example of, let's say, you've got a Telnet server on the internet and you send it 65 A's and it crashes, well, this is something that was a problem, but how do we know if it's actually a vulnerability? In order to do that, we have to actually look at the instructions within the program and recognize where was it carving out storage for this data, what actually happened that caused it to do something wrong. Was it that the software said, hey, this is not the right input, we should just abort and close ourselves gracefully? Or did it actually have a mathematical error and write data into a place on the computer system where it was not supposed to? Um, so we use reverse engineering tools to inspect programs on a computer and get an idea of um, what's happening when we feed input into those programs. So reverse engineering is a, is a tool in the, the vulnerability researcher's toolkit. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, in general, reverse engineering is the process of trying to put back in the information that was lost when a system or a software package is being put together. 
and use that to recover the initial intent or the design, the flow of an application or a program. Well, and, and maybe we should draw a distinction between reverse engineering as a as a process or a concept and specific reverse engineering tools. Because, you know, you could take that situation where you're sending 65 A's and the, you know, the, the application on the other end crashes, and you could reverse engineer what's happening happening there by sending different types of input and basically through trial and error coming to to a conclusion about what specific input is causing the problem. That would be sort of conceptually that would be reverse engineering, right? Yes. And yeah, that's definitely a valid um tactic towards reverse engineering is simple trial and error. But and you know, in the early days, um if you wanted to reverse a program, you might actually open it up in a hex editor and you would read through the hex bytes and confer back or refer back to the processor instruction manuals and you could take those hex codes and translate them into individual instructions and start working through to identify problems in that sense. So hex dump um, would be one of the original uh, reverse engineering tools, so to speak. But we've, as an industry, we've we've moved beyond that uh, at this point. So there are also specific tools in the market that are designed to allow someone like you doing vulnerability research to uh, understand what a what a program is is doing, uh, so that you can you know reverse engineer the the code, right? Yeah, and so um, some of the most basic tools like this would be um, required as part of developer toolkits. So you're not going to get very far with developing a complex computer system if you don't have a way of debugging it. And debugging inherently means to some extent that there needs to be reverse engineering. Um, so on the Linux world, you have GNU tools like OBJ, OBJ dump, objdump, um, and others that will allow you to interpret the ELF binary headers and um, parse out functions and see disassembly so that you can understand what a program was doing. On the Windows side, you've got WinDebug and um, some of the other tools that are part of Visual Studio, which are going to allow you to do this. But these are um, rough tools that will just get you started. So obviously, um, do they do they assume that you have you have the source code somewhere that you're you're going to go and make changes? Like from a debugging perspective, if you're a developer, the assumption is that you're using that tool to go then fix something that isn't working in the well, code. Sometimes debugging is about looking for compatibility issues as well. So for example, um, working on the Tripwire products, we've seen before that Microsoft will change something within an API. We don't have source code for the Windows APIs, but um, it has been necessary before to actually perform reverse engineering, um, looking into these binaries to understand what had changed so that we could be able to keep our products compatible with these operations. Hmm. I see. So that's that's one group uh, the, of tools that you were talking about. I think you were headed towards a, a, a second group. Yeah, so um, beyond these basic tools for being able to analyze binaries, which really you can get very far with these tools, but there are other more specialized tools that have come out um, over the years. So in the open source community, you have things like Radar. Um, in the closed source community, the proprietary tools, the big heavy hitter of this branding is IDA, IDA. Um, and these software packages can get into the um, thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to have comprehensive support, support for being able to reverse engineer complex systems. Um, a lot of the free tools, uh, <clears throat> they've done well over the years, but there's just always been a huge variation between what you're going to get out of a tool that is cheap or free compared to what you would get out of um, one of these premium products like Ida Pro. Hmm. Uh, so we're also here to talk a little bit about a class that you you uh, taught back at Sector um, around one of these specific tools, which is, is Ghidra, right? Yeah, so the Ghidra tool was really a game changer in this space. Um, while previously, if you wanted to get this premium quality decompilation support you're talking about thousands of dollars of investment. Um, the National Security Agency of the United States released to the public their tool set for doing reverse engineering and decompilation, and it's absolutely a fabulous tool. I'm not going to um, say that it is as good or better than Ida Pro, but it is an amazing tool for being free and opens up a lot of possibilities for 
um, individuals, students, whoever, people from companies that aren't looking to spend five figures on um, software reverse engineering tools and gives them the ability to actually um, get their hands in and see high quality decompilation associated with binaries that they might want to analyze. It's really been an amazing tool. And uh, I wanted to be able to get more people involved with using this. So yeah, I've prepared some course material that I taught at the Black Hat Sector trainings this past year um, to get people familiar with using Ghidra. So uh, it's interesting. I mean, Ghidra being introduced or released by the, the NSA and effectively lowering the barrier to entry into this particular part of information security. I, I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. It seems like a big deal uh, in terms of the vulnerability research community. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a big deal for offensive and defensive research because it democratizes these kinds of capabilities in a major way. Do you have any thoughts about why the NSA chose to do that? I mean, is it something that, that they've published or talked about? Um, yeah, actually, I had attended a presentation at the Recon Conference in Montreal the other year where they talked about this a little bit. And they have their, their public reasons about wanting to show um, what that they're giving back to society and whatnot. But uh, I think more likely this has something to do with wanting to regain some PR after the debacles with shadow brokers. Hmm. Yeah. And yeah. NSA has had some egg on their face over the years of being criticized that they're not doing enough to um, actively help information security defenses within the U.S. And this is something that is helpful towards that end. So have have we seen, do you think we've seen a, a, a change in the research community since the, the release of Ghidra? Is that is that something that we can actually um, see or measure in some way? Um, I suspect that if you did some analysis of Twitter sentiment that you could find uh, quite a bit of justification that people have been ditching their IDA Pro licenses. And just going back to the last question for a second um, about why the NSA would do this, uh, there's another kind of elephant in the room here, which is that bringing this product to the community opens up a large developer base for support for new processors and other kinds of enhancements to it. Um, so NSA is definitely benefiting from, for example, new CPU specifications that are coming out of community contributions that only happened because Ghidra is available to everyone. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if they had a tool that they were using internally that they were getting value out of, but they couldn't effectively keep up support for the variety of, of platforms that were out there, that move of, of open sourcing it would potentially help solve that problem for them. Yeah, it definitely opens up opportunities for them to get a wider base of development support. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. What made you choose to not only, I mean, I understand why you're, you're using Ghidra, you know, as part of your, your job for research. What made you decide to, to teach about it? Like, what was the motivation behind that? I had some discussions with, um, people within InfoSec on Reddit and Discord channels. And it seemed like there were a lot of people that were really excited about the fact that Ghidra is there, maybe a little bit distrustful about the fact that NSA had put it out there. But, um, a lot of people seemed intimidated about actually shifting over from their experience with Ida Pro and um, Binja, what other, whatever other tools they've been using to actually dive into Ghidra. So I thought that this would be a good opportunity to kind of do some hand-holding and show not just these are the features of Ghidra, but also here is how you use these features to perform these various tasks. So in the class, we'll look over a Mirai sample and identify here's how you can see where there's some suspicious activity that they're obfuscating some functionality. And if we dig into it through these techniques, we can ultimately recover the cryptography keys that are being used to protect the settings 
And I walk the class through how to then recover from a real world Mirai malware sample, um, the botnet configuration that would tell it where the command and control server was. Well, you're, you're bringing up an interesting point because I, I tend to think of reverse engineering in the context of vulnerability discovery. So reverse engineering a legitimate application, you know, looking for ways that, that it might, uh, might be vulnerable to exploit. But you bring up a, an example of reverse engineering malware as a means to, to defend against it more effectively. And that's, that's a different use case. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, m- much of what I do is related to looking for um, code paths of new vulnerabilities. But in my IoT research especially, um, I run some honeypots, and I will from time to time get interesting malware samples. And they, they tend to be somewhat easy to analyze, but every once in a while you can see from these um, other exploits that are being delivered through uh, the same malware, so you can learn things from that. You can also learn things about the um, owner of the infrastructure that was being used for the malware campaigns. So definitely there's a lot of fascinating use cases for malware research. Hmm, yeah, well, it expands the value. I mean, I, I think, you know, it gives me a different perspective a little bit on on the NSA angle there too, you know, expanding the pool of not just vulnerability researchers, but of people doing research on malware in the wild um, has has a net benefit as well. Yeah, I mean, in general, I think the NSA benefits from a more technically literate population. Yeah, that's true. And it expands their, I mean, the, the you know, the open source release isn't limited to, to the United States by any means, so it expands to more of an international audience as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting move, and it feels like it. It's it's changing, you know, sort of that that landscape of tools in a meaningful way. But it doesn't, you know, it's not the be all and end all, right? Um, people still use the commercial tools. There's still a viable business there. So what is it that, um, what is it that 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 Ghidra is missing? Like, what's coming next? Why is it important? Um, where should that tool go in order to continue servicing the community? Yeah, so in a nutshell, um, the the biggest missing feature would be debugging and emulation support. So if you're using Ida Pro, for example, um, I could load up a binary from an IoT device, and I can then instruct Ida to connect to a debugging server that I've loaded on that device and interactively step through the disassembly. Um, or if you have the decompilation, decompiler edition, the decompilation, of course. Um, Ghidra does not currently have that, but it's actually interesting to see they, they've been talking about adding debugging support, um, meaning the ability to actively debug a binary that you're reverse engineering. Um, they've been talking about this for some time. And now in the last couple months, I saw that they've actually pushed a repo into Git, which seems to have support for debugging. And in the notes there, they're also indicating that this will be growing to introduce support for emulation as well. Um, What's really cool about that is it means that you could actually take, say, a firmware image or files dumped off of an embedded device and start working with them in Ghidra. And if you come to a piece of code that you maybe don't fully understand, you can allow Ghidra to start emulating the CPU that's backing it and the C libraries perhaps as well, and walking through and debugging that code to get a better understanding of it. Um, this isn't there yet, the emulation support, but the developers have noted in the release notes that um, you're discouraged from working on that on your own because they expect to put it in as a proper feature in the future. Oh, what does that mean you're discouraged from working on your own? Uh, basically, like they, they don't want people to go ahead and spend their time implementing the emulation support as a particular type of plugin because it would be a wasted effort when they later ah, come out and release yeah. it as a core feature. Some, somebody else is working on it, so you'd be duplicating your effort. Yes. That makes sense. That makes sense. I get it. Okay. Interesting. So, you know, in conclusion here, I mean, we started with a little bit of, of where vulnerability research was. And I, I just want to think a little bit here of like how it started and how it's going. You know, that, that meme that, <laughs> that you've probably seen around. And I'm just thinking about it from a, a vulnerability research perspective. If you think back, Craig, to when you sort of started doing vulnerability research, how were you spending your time in comparison to how you spend it now? What are the biggest changes that have occurred? Um, yeah, so when I started my vulnerability research, it was a lot more fuzzing oriented. So 
Uh, fuzzing, if you don't know, is basically generating inputs that are expected to be invalid and throwing them at a system and seeing what kind of different results you get. Um, it's kind of just a brute force trial and error oftentimes when you're trying Time to break a system. It. Yeah, but also it was wildly effective for many, many years. And then the advent of more sophisticated fuzzing tools that would do generational fuzzing just kept on getting results for a long time. But um, over time, these types of flaws that you can find through fuzzers, they become less and less, and you start getting into other kinds of flaws that become rather difficult to see without doing more involved analysis techniques, either having a manual inspection of the source code or being able to transform the source code into an intermediary language the way that Ghidra does, and then running it through symbolic processing and stuff like that to be able to do taint analysis and recognize um, more nuanced behaviors that aren't going to show up as easily by just uh, throwing random data at an application. So if I were to sort of summarize that, you, you, you started spending your time you know, interacting with fuzzers or creating input for fuzzing and now you spend more of your time doing reverse engineering through through tools like Ghidra. Yeah, definitely. I spend a lot more time now if I'm going to analyze a new system and I have access to the binaries, I will first be reviewing what API calls it's making and tracing back code to try and find initial points to start that fuzz or to just start manual testing around. Well, it sounds pretty interesting and it sounds like uh, you know the industry's made a lot of progress there. Are you planning on uh, doing any more teaching? Do you have anything coming up that um, people should be aware of? Um, my schedule for this year is still pending, but uh, if you keep posted on the State of Security blog, there will be updates. All right. So you'd, you'd like to do more teaching and you're looking for opportunities. Is that a reasonable way to put it? Yes. Uh, right now, there's some training sessions that are pending, but they're, they're private sessions. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get out to some conferences this year, but with uh, COVID and everything, it's been a little bit um, up in the air. Yeah, everything has, it seems. It's true. It's true. All right. Well, listen, Craig, I really want to thank you for joining us. I think it was a really interesting conversation. Um, I hope everybody who's listening found it interesting as well. And, uh, you know, we'll look forward to more material coming from you, both on the, the vulnerability research side and uh, on the, uh, the tool usage and teaching side. Thank you, Tim. I really enjoyed it as well. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. As I said, I hope it was interesting and enlightening, and I hope you'll join us for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.